Okay. Well, our Valentine children's message this morning reminded me of when I was in elementary school and uh, we had a Valentine custom that some of you may have also had. We would give Valentines to each other. And invariably, there would be some children who would get all kinds of Valentines, sometimes even candy and other things. But did you know that there would invariably be some that would get no Valentines or maybe one or two? Maybe some of you were that person. Maybe some of you didn't get very many Valentines. And you felt like you had been snobbed. You felt like you had been discriminated against. You felt like people had shown partiality toward you. Well, that happens to be the topic that James is addressing today. Now, maybe some of us have acquaintances who are snobs. Now, I'm sure that here within these hallowed walls, we don't have any snobbery. But in reality, there are a lot of snobs in our world today, and nobody likes a snob person who plays favorites, whether it's a teacher at school, a boss on the job, the president of the PTA, president of the women's club, but it's especially painful when we find ourselves on the wrong end of snobbery. In fact, it's a very hot political issue in America today because a form of this is called profiling, and oftentimes it becomes a racial or an economic profile that takes place. A recent survey in the Minneapolis Star Tribune said that African Americans are 42 times more likely to be arrested for not having a valid driver's license. I wonder how in the world they would they be able to see that that was the case. I think the term they use is driving while black. And unfortunately, uh, that sort of thing happens in our country today. But there's prejudice, there's snobbery, there's profiling, and um, these aren't problems in the Church of Jesus Christ, are they? Well, reality, they, they can be, and they are. And uh, it was Dr. Martin Luther King himself that said, 11 a.m. Sunday is the most segregated hour in the church today. I thought that was when I heard that, and I remember hearing Dr. King say that. I thought that was a profound statement. 11 a.m. Sunday, when people gathered to worship Jesus Christ, the most segregated hour in America. And it's not just race, it's economics. In fact, that's the example that James is going to give us in this passage of Scripture. Social status, attitudes toward friends and acquaintances. Now think about it. You have any acquaintances who are snobs, people you work with or have contact with, uh, even subtle snobs, people that play favorites or shun some people. And by the way, this can actually happen in families as well. Uh, maybe he's a geek or she's weird or, you know, these are the kind of things. I have a couple of examples that, that I'm aware of. In one situation, a youth pastor told me about some of his young people in the church. And uh, a couple of three of them had gone off to Bible college. And when they came home, they didn't want to have much to do with the rest of the people in the youth group because they had been to Bible college and the others had. Uh, another was a uh, friend of mine who was a, a leader in a local church and uh, they had a man in to candidate to, uh, as a pastor. And uh, several of the members decided they didn't like him. And they said, well, he sounded like he was from the country. He had sort of a hillbilly accent and we didn't think he was really up to our standards. Um, and I could go on and on with examples like that. But this uh, passage of Scripture helps us to address that. We lived in Birmingham. The snobs lived over the mountain. In Dallas, you know what direction it is? It's North Dallas. You've heard that before. And in reality, in every city where you are, I have friends in Houston, and they talk about, well, yeah, I won't go into those. But... Uh, James is extremely practical. Uh, he has already addressed the remedy for sin in general. He's given us a short uh, uh, remedy, uh, and that's the new birth. And the long-term remedy is taking in the Word of God. He says, become doers of the Word of God and not hearers. 
That was his message in chapter 1. That you need to be looking into the law of liberty and continuing in it, verse 25 of chapter 1. Not being a forgetful hearer, but a doer, you'll be blessed in what you do. And then he gives some specific things there. Talks about don't uh, let your tongue get out of control. He says, visit the orphans and widows in their affliction. Keep yourself unspotted from the world. Then in chapter 2, he zeroes in on this particular issue, specific issue. And a very practical way James attacks this issue head on. Uh, James is not known for beating around the bush. In fact, I'm sure that James was probably the kind of person in his preaching that would encourage people to wear steel-toed sandals when they came to the church service in Jerusalem because he would step on their toes. And notice he begins by identifying the problem. He says, our faith and favoritism are incompatible. My brethren, he reminds them, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. We have trusted him as Savior. And uh, I remember reading that uh, actually it was uh, Robert E. Lee who once made the statement because he knelt next to a black man in church and somebody said, how could you do that? He said, the ground is always level at the foot of the cross. Very profound statement. The ground is level. Whatever your economic, whatever your racial background, whatever your background, if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. He says, my brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. Very pointed statement identifying the problem here. And the real issue is the character of Christ. What he actually says, the way the Greek is worded, stop holding the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory and partiality. Now he's going to mention the royal law of liberty, the law of love. He's going to remind us of love your neighbor as yourself. But he starts off by saying partiality is like oil and water when it comes to loving your neighbor as yourself. They just don't mix. So here is the problem. God doesn't show favoritism. I think about Acts chapter 10, verse 34, where Peter makes the statement, I've come to understand that God is not a respecter of persons. Now, Peter uh, was a guy who really uh, was proud of his Jewish heritage and background. And he was invited to come and visit a man named Cornelius. Cornelius was a Gentile. And uh, Jewish and Gentile people in those days didn't have much to do with each other. And God had to sort of communicate with Peter in a pointed way. And he let down a sheep from heaven showing him some animals that they had considered unclean. In fact, the law said they were unclean. Three times Peter saw this vision. And uh, finally, Peter got the message. These guys are knocking on the door saying, we want you to come see our boss, the centurion Cornelius. Peter would have been unwilling to do that, I believe, before he had those, that thrifold vision. And he got there, and Cornelius said, you know, I want to know about this Jesus that you're preaching. And then Peter says, I see that God is not a respecter of persons. Now, I had a Sunday school back in Alabama, Sunday school teacher, who misquoted that verse. He several times said, God is no respectable person. That is not what the verse is saying. The verse is saying, God is no respecter of persons. God doesn't look at you and say, well, you're done in Grand Street rating is so-and-so. You live in a really nice house in a nice neighborhood. Uh, you drive a nice car. You're of the right ethnic background and origin. You've checked with 23 and me to make sure that your ethnicity is just right. All of those kinds of things. No, this passage of Scripture is telling us there is no place for partiality in the body of Christ. And then James is going to give us an illustration in verses 2 and 3. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, by the way, the number of gold rings you wore back then sort of told what your economic status was. And there come, should come in also a poor man in filthy clothes. By the way, James has used that word filthy already uh, to talk about uh, the, the kind of filthiness that can happen morally 
He used that in chapter 1, uh, verse 21. Now he's using that word to describe the kind of clothes that people wear. And he said, this, the problem is not that the two people have come to church. The problem is where did the ushers usher them to sit? And you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you, and the emphasis on the you, sit here in a good place. And they would have a good place. They wouldn't have to walk far from the door. They would be able to hear the speaker and see the speaker. And they would seat this person in that place in the synagogue. And remember, he's writing to Jewish Christians who had spent a lot of their time in the synagogue. And then you say to the poor man, you stand over there or you sit here on the floor. By the way, when I was in India and attended church and spoke in church, they had a number of the people who sat on the floor. And uh, there were a few people that had benches and pews, but for the most part, people sat on the floor. <clears throat> Here the inference is, you sit on the floor, you sit at my footstool, you're not worthy to have a seat. Or they would have a bench at the very back, and they would say, you sit back there in the very back. Now we all know that in our day and time, that kind of prejudice is not acceptable. This is not uh, the kind of thing that should happen in the body of Christ. But it was happening in the early church, and James wants to address it. And he's going to give an application in verse 4. Now, if you're doing this, James says, you're showing partiality among yourselves. And it's interesting, in chapter 1, he used the phrase double-minded. Remember back in verse 6 of chapter 1, the man that doesn't, uh, that uh, actually verse 8, verse 6, he says, if you're asking and not asking in faith and you're doubting, you're like a wave of the sea and you won't get any answer to your prayer. Why? Verse 8, he is a double-minded man. And the word comes from the same root there, showing partiality. You are double-minded. You have a different standard for one person than you have for another. You're just like that kid back in elementary school that's giving the valentine to the popular guy or the popular gal, and you're ignoring the other one. And he says, you have become judges with evil thoughts. Now, who is the ultimate judge? God himself, absolutely. God is the ultimate judge. Does he tell us to judge? In fact, Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, said, judge not lest you, what? Be judged. Be judged, right. He said, you're going to be judged if you judge others. And here James says, you're not only judges, you're judges who have evil intentions, who have evil thoughts. And so that's his application. And he poses it as a question. And there are two charges here. You are lacking in discernment. You're double-minded. And you have thought evil against a brother or sister in Christ. Now, as he goes on here, he's going to give an argument or a series of arguments beginning in verse 5. And he's going to present these in a form of questions. James is good at this. By the way, I'm involved in helping to train Christian life coaches. One of the things that we teach life coaches is that you get a long way down the line in coaching by asking questions. And James is sort of putting on his life coach hat here. Go with his pastoral hat. He's going to ask questions. Listen, my beloved brethren. By the way, that's the second time he's underscored the fact that we're in a family. We're the body of Christ. We're the family of God. And in the family, they're not first-class citizens and second-class citizens or high-class citizens and low-class citizens. It says, my beloved brethren, people that I love, has not God chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? When I read this passage, I think of something that Jesus told about a rich man and Lazarus. Uh, some of you may remember that from Luke's Gospel, about the 16th chapter. And uh, in that account, there was a rich man who fared sumptuously every day. He had fine clothes, lots of friends, ate high on the hog, we would say today, although if he was Jewish, he probably didn't eat high on the hog. You know, they, they resisted that. Uh, and then sitting at his gate, 
was a beggar who was poor and ragged and filthy and undressed, and we're told his name. <clears throat> and a lot of people have assumed this is a parable, but Jesus never gave the name of a person in a parable. And I'm inclined to think this was not a parable, this was a true account. And you remember what happened. The rich man died, and what does it say next? He was buried. That's the whole story about the rich man. But Lazarus died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And then the rich man lifted up his eyes in hell, being in torment, and said, Father Abraham, why can't I come over there, in essence? And then he said, if I could just get Lazarus to come over here and dip his finger in, in the water and cool my tongue because I'm tormented in this flame. You see, Lazarus, though he was poor, though he was an outcast in this life, evidently had put his faith in the God of Israel and was carried into Abraham's bosom, which is where Old Testament saints went. The rich man, trusting in his riches rather than God, did not uh, receive eternal life because he had rejected. He says, God has chosen the poor, and Lazarus is a great example of that, to be rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom he promised to those who love him. And you know, it's inconsistent for us to love God, and we've already been told, as we saw in a message a few weeks ago, that loving the Lord with all your heart and soul and mind and strength is where God wants you to begin in terms of your responsibilities. And the very next statement he makes is love your neighbor as yourself. God has made promises to those who love him. But, he says in verse 6, see, here's the problem. Showing partiality really runs contrary to God's actions. But you have dishonored the poor man. God honored the poor man. You've dishonored the poor man. And then he raises another question. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you have been called? And in these two questions, he demonstrates that partiality toward the wealthy goes against both experience and common sense. Some people talk about biting the hand that feeds them. These people were feeding the hand that bit them. They were basically creating a situation where people who were persecuting them, they were kowtowing and showing partiality toward them. And he says, these are people not only who offend you, who not only drag you into court, who not only foreclose on your ha houses. In fact, Jesus had condemned some of the wealthy people in Matthew 23 who were foreclosing on widows and making, as a pretense, long prayers in the synagogue. He says, these people are blaspheming that noble name by which you are called. They have rejected the Lord. They have blasphemed the Lord's name. So it goes against experience and common sense. Not only that, he goes on to say, if you really, verse 8, fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well, verse 8. But verse 9, if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. So in reality, when you're demonstrating partiality towards some people as opposed to others, in this case specifically the wealthy, you're going against the vile, you're violating God's royal law. And uh, God's royal law was first found in Leviticus 19.18. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And in fact, Jesus repeated that in Matthew's gospel, Matthew 22.39. He repeated it in Luke's Gospel uh, in the account about the Good Samaritan. In fact, you may recall that the account that Jesus gave of the Good Samaritan was given in the context of uh, who is my neighbor? Remember the guy asked the question. He said, well, who is my neighbor? And in essence, what he was trying to do was be exclusive because the Jews did not consider Gentiles a neighbor. They did not consider Samaritans a neighbor. In fact, they go way out of their way to avoid any contact with the Samaritans. They were engaging in racial profiling in the first century. Profiling against Gentiles, profiling against 
Samaritans in particular. And then Jesus tells the story about a man who was mugged on the way from Jerusalem down to Jericho and left for dead. A priest comes along. You'd think this is the highest of the clergy. He passes by on the other side. Then a Levite comes along. He walks over and takes a close look at the guy, notices all the wounds, and then what did he do? He went on as well. And then a guy comes along, Jesus identified as a Samaritan. And again, he was from a mixed race. He was a biracial person. The uh, Samaritans uh, were mingled as both Jew and Gentile. And they were a hated race by Jews and Gentiles. And the Samaritan becomes the hero of Jesus' story. Because he comes over, he sees the man, he had compassion on him, he bound up his wounds, he put him on his own donkey, and he carried him down to the end of the Good Samaritan, which is what it's called today. I don't know what it was called back then. And uh, he said, take care of this man. They did not have an emergency room. They didn't have urgent care back then, none of that. But he took him to this inn. And he said, here are two denarii. This is my payment. And if he, I, any more is owed, when I come back, I'll take care of that. And then Jesus asked him, who do you think really cared about and showed favor for this wounded man? And the guy, the scribe, who had asked Jesus, who is my neighbor, couldn't even say the word, the Samaritan. He said, him who showed mercy. To whom Jesus said, you go and do likewise. Which is exactly what Jesus' half-brother James is saying to the church right here. He's saying, you need to be fulfilling the royal law of love which according to the scripture is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And if you don't do that, you're not doing well, you're committing a sin. You're falling short of God's glory, and you're convicted by the law of transgressors. And then this next verse is one of the most pointed verses in all the Bible. For whoever shall keep the whole law, and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. By the way, this is a verse that I've used many times in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with people. Because the average person, if you want to talk to them about Christ and about salvation, one of the first things many of them will do is say, well, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. You ever heard that? I'm not as bad. I've never murdered anybody. Jesus said, I've got an answer for you. If you've never murdered, maybe you've committed adultery. And in fact, you may recall that committing adultery doesn't have to be an outward act. You can commit adultery in your heart with lust. And you can commit murder in your heart with hatred and bitterness. And that all comes out of Matthew chapter 5 and chapter 6. So the reality is, what he's saying is, you may keep the whole law. You may never violate the law. But then again, you may have one day when you're driving down Stone Road and the... Uh, Lights are flashing. The school zone, most of you know that Stone Road is the school zone during the week. And uh, you just happen to have a little bit of a heavy foot on that particular day. Maybe you're even in, in a hurry to get to a meeting at church. And a uh, police officer from Wiley's Finest pulls you over. And you say, you know, I have never broken the speed limit in the city of Wiley. I've never broken the speed limit in Collin County. I've never broken the speed limit in Dallas. I've never broken the speed limit anywhere I've been. The officer takes out his pad and he says, I don't care. I've got you doing 45 in a 20 mile an hour zone. I've got the evidence. You see, that's what James is saying right here. You've kept the whole law. You've kept every bit of it, which again, we all know is a human impossibility. And you offend in one point, you're guilty of all. If somebody's accused of murder, you know, and they say, well, I've never murdered anybody else. How far is that going to get you in court? If somebody says, I've never robbed a bank before, but I really had some financial needs this week, and so I just went down to the bank and 
felt like they could share a little bit of all the money they had in there with me. That's not going to get you off the hook. And that's exactly what James is saying right here. Now I want to apply this to the matter of personal salvation today as well. Because you see, for every single one of us needs a Savior. Every single one of us has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. No matter how good we've been, no matter how religious we've been, no matter how many times we've attended church, you may have a perfect attendance in Sunday school from the time you were three years old till the time you're 83 years old. And the reality is, the Bible still says we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And it goes on to say that the wages, the penalty for sin is death, Romans 6, 23. So every single one of us faces a death penalty. Not just physical death, we're all going to die physically, but spiritual death, eternal separation from God, apart from Jesus Christ. And you can never keep the law and earn salvation. You can never do good works. You can never use church membership or baptism or any of these other things that are good things for Christians to do. But they're not the way to become a Christian. They're not the way to be saved. You see, we have to admit that we're sinners. We can't save ourselves. And the penalty for sin was paid when Jesus shed his blood and his body was broken on the cross. Whenever we partake of communion, we're always symbolizing what our Savior did and remembering how much he loved us and how he gave his life to forgive our sins and to cleanse us and to make us right with God. And that means the one thing that's left for us to do is to trust in Him. And my word to you this morning, if you have not yet done so, whatever your background, whatever your age, whatever your status financially or otherwise, if you've not yet trusted Jesus as your personal Savior, there is no better time to do that than today to make sure that you have trusted Him and have received the gift of everlasting life. Because it says here, you keep the whole law. You've offended in one point. You're declared to be guilty. And He goes on to explain, just to elaborate in verse 11, He who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. So if you don't commit adultery, but you do murder, you become a transgressor of the law. And then he comes to his conclusion in verses 12 and 13. So speak and so do. Now remember, he's talking to believers here. And he says, I want your speech to be like those who be judged by the law of liberty. What was the law of liberty? Love your neighbor as yourself. That's the perfect law, the royal law of liberty that he already talked about up here in verse 8. And you'll be judged by that law. So our speech needs to be without prejudice. It needs to be without snobbery. And uh, our actions, so do. And the uses of present tense here, consistently our speech, consistently our actions, because we will be judged by the law of liberty. And then he goes on to say, finally, for judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. The person who is exercising prejudice in the church, he says, is not demonstrating mercy, is not demonstrating the grace of God. But here's his final conclusion, mercy triumphs over judgment. I believe this applies to us where we work, where we go to school, our neighborhood, and certainly in our church, that God wants us in our speech and in our actions to demonstrate love for every single person, whatever their background, whatever their financial status, whatever, however their appearance is, whatever their racial background. One of the things I'm so thankful for to see in India is how in spite of the fact that they have a caste system in much of India, that the believers in Jesus Christ have people all the way from the, the higher caste to the Dalit, the untouchable, and they're all together in the body of Christ. What a testimony that is. May God help us to so speak and so do as those judged by the royal law of liberty. Let's pray together. 
And if I'm talking to someone this morning who's not yet trusted Christ, there would be no better time than right now to make that commitment to Him, to say, Lord Jesus, I believe You died for me and rose again, and I'm placing my trust in You as my personal Savior. And that's my prayer that You will do that. Father, I pray the Spirit of God will work in each of our hearts that we might not be guilty of snobbery or profiling or prejudice in any way. For Jesus' sake, amen.